those musicians are going to fit right in in heaven, aren't they? They're going to do just right. Thank you. Take your Bible tonight and go to Genesis chapter 39. We're in our series on Sunday evenings about the life of Joseph. And tonight, Joseph is going to make his way in this passage into Potiphar's house, and we'll talk about him in just a minute. Last week, if you were here in chapter 38, we talked about it. It almost seemed like a, a digression or a diversion. We were reading passages about the life of Joseph, and then all of a sudden there's this whole chapter about Judah. And not only is it a chapter about Judah, but it's some crazy stuff in there. I mean, there's three sons, and two of them married to Tamar, and the oldest one died, and then the next one married her, and God killed both the older boys for being wicked, and then uh, Judah wouldn't give her as he should to the younger boy, and so she dressed up like a harlot, and, and he slept with her and had twins. So that's the only kind of stuff you, you finally find out in the Bible. That's, I don't know, you know, you couldn't make that stuff up. But uh, God's point in that last chapter that we said, well, you know, it's kind of like a diversion. The point is God was proving and showing Judah and others that he's sovereign and that if he decides the younger is going to rule over the older, then leave it alone. That's, that's what God's going to do. And so uh, God moved in Judah's life. And we know God eventually will use these accounts uh, with, jo with Joseph's life to touch the heart of all the, all the brothers and, and they'll, uh, they'll turn from their sin and God will use them to make a great nation. But that's what we saw in chapter 38. Now, the last time we saw Joseph, he was in a, in a pickle, wasn't he? He went to looking for his brothers. His daddy sent him to look for his brothers 65 miles away from from Hebron, and he finds them, and they, they see him coming from a long way off because he's wearing that coat that they just love so much, and uh, they decided they were going to kill him when he got there. They plotted murder, and they all agreed on it, and when he got there, they threw him in a pit and left him there while they were eating, and, and it was Judah, by the way, who came up with the plan, that, hey, there's some traitors coming on Ishmaelites going to Egypt, so let's just sell him and instead of killing him, and we can do two things at once. We can make some pocket change. And we can get rid of him for good, because if he goes down to Egypt as a slave, we'll never see him again, and we'll lie to Dad and tell him that he got killed, and we'll be all done with, with uh, Joseph, and his dreams will go with him. They miscalculated, didn't they? Because, see, they forgot they're dealing with God. They're not dealing with just normal stuff. And so uh, that was the plan, and so they sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites. Look at verse 1 of chapter 39, and it kind of summarizes it. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. Now the first thing I want to, we're only going to go through verse 6 tonight because I want to save the middle part for us to deal with in totality. But there's quite a few things in these first six verses, and the first one is this. Life is full of what I call in my notes trauma, like unexpected tragedies like thing you know you're going along and life seems to be normal and suddenly it's anything but normal suddenly catastrophe suddenly life altering things now we all have a bad day sherry says i have too many but we have, we have bad days okay but but sometimes they're not just bad days they're they're traumatizing they're 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 events that shake you to your core and Joseph is having one of those days. This isn't, this isn't just a bad event in his life. Do you understand his brothers plotted to kill him? That'll scar a 17-year-old. They take his coat, throw him in a pit. The threat of death... And the fact that this 17-year-old young man in his own family is facing the end of his life by the hands of those whom he's doing good to. I mean, he came to find them because his dad asked him to. He came to look for them because his dad cared about them. And he brought good, and they returned good with evil. Remember, uh, Joseph is a type of Christ, is he not? We talked about that. Jesus came to do us good, pay him with evil. And always have because we're sinful. Joseph came to do good. Brothers were going to kill him. That's traumatizing. The second thing that brought trauma to his life that day was to be sold into slavery. 
Joseph's future in the family was bright. His dad, he was the favorite. He was going to be the heir apparent. And his brother Benjamin were the favorites of their father because they were the children of the favorite wife. We talked about how polygamy was not God's design and how it brought great difficulty to Jacob's home. Here's another example of it. Joseph's future looked bright in the home, but now because of the hatred of his brothers, his life is for really forever. He's not going back home to Hebron. He's going to Egypt. His life and his freedom, his ability to choose his own way is now no more. He's been sold into slavery to the Ishmaelites, and they're going to take him down to Egypt. And his future, from his perspective, is unknown. Now, from God's perspective, it's never unknown because he's sovereign. But do we not enter into instances in our life of trauma, we'll call it, of of great events, and it creates much unknown? And as human beings, we hate unknowns. We don't like it. We don't, we don't, I know I don't, I don't like the feeling of not being in control. And I don't know if that's a guy thing or if it's just a human thing. My life is planned. I have a calendar. I know already planned things for this week. And when unknowns come in and things that mess up our schedule, it gets us all out of whack, doesn't it? And it gets us all out of sorts. I would suggest to you that Joseph is all out of sorts here. He was going to die, and now he's figured out he's not going to die, and that his brothers are going to sell him, and they sell him into slavery. Now he's now he's uh, uh, locked up in chains, or or however they were transporting him. Now he's connected to these people that he doesn't know, who are going to take him to Egypt, and he doesn't know what they're going to do with him. So unknowns unsettle us. Unknowns bother us. I'll tell you a third thing that I think really was catastrophic in Joseph's life was to lose all connection to his family. For a 17-year-old, he's never going to see his dad again in his mind. Now, we know he will because God recorded it for us. In his mind, he's never going to see his dad again. In his mind, he's never going to see his brother Benjamin again, whom he loves very much. He's never going to be able to to do the things that he's done with his family, you know, all the celebrations, the feasts, the things, all those are gone in his life. His life is going to be so completely different that he's going to feel like it's over. And this is the point where some people, particularly those who don't know Christ, come to a point of despair. Why should I live on? And people get depressed. I was studying this this week and thinking, I was 19 years old when I joined the Navy. I was two years older than Joseph in this story. 17 and 19 is not very old, okay? 17 and 19, you don't know squat. I mean, you don't, I mean, let's think back to when you were 17, 19. You think you know a lot, and you don't really know much, right? I mean, but you think you do. And I remember joining the military and thought I was, man, I'm in the military. Got the uniform to prove it. Got the haircut that shows it, you know, the whole deal, right? And they sent me on my first deployment to John F. Kennedy. You know how you know you're getting old? Those ships are not in the fleet anymore. They're gone. They decommissioned them bad boys just like me. They decommissioned me and sent me on my way. The John F. Kennedy, CV-67, only, cla- only, only carrier of its class, only one of its kind, last conventional carrier built that wasn't nuclear, so they sent me to Norfolk, Virginia in the wintertime. You ever been to Norfolk in the wintertime? Yuck. Terrible. Snow and wet and ice and rain. And they sent me there as a, as a 19-year-old kid and put me on this ship. If you've never been on an aircraft carrier before, the only way you know where the front's at is it's pointing. I mean, you walk onto that thing and it's massive until you figure out the numbers and, the, you know, they teach you all that stuff. They put me on this ship and said, this is your home for the next six months. Now, I'm going to tell you, as a 19-year-old, six months seemed like forever. And I can remember asking them, where am I going to sleep? And they said, pick one of those racks. And we were stacked three or four high, three deep. We looked like firewood in there, man. I mean, you know, I mean, you just couldn't imagine. You know, the guy sleeping next to me, there was this little metal thing 
and our feet could touch, but they never did. <laughs> but they could, all right? And they had this metal thing, and you know, you were like stacked in there, there was a guy above you and a guy below you, and they said, that one's yours. And so you chain your seat back to that thing. And I remember laying there the first night thinking, I said this to myself, my life is over for the next six months. <laughs> That's what I thought. Man, I am, I am going to be stuck on, it's like going to be like prison. It's going to be like jail. I, I can relate to Joseph is what I'm telling you. As a 19-year-old, I had that feeling of emptiness and despair. And I was like, this is, you know, this is crazy. And I was thinking, little did I know, though, by the way, to finish the story, that in that three-year sea duty, I would do three deployments back to back, six months, nine months, and six months. You talk about somebody ready to get out of the Navy after his first three years in, I was looking for the door, but uh, it didn't work out that way. But the point is, I could, when I was studying this, I was thinking, man, I've never been rejected by my family or sent off into a foreign land or anything, but I was in, so, in a certain way confined to this ship, sent overseas to places I'd never been, languages I couldn't speak, people that weren't like me, and, and it was different, and it was, and it was traumatic in many ways. And, and listen, here's the question. When we run into this kind of adversity in life, whether we be 17 or 27 or, or 77, how do you survive that stuff? How do you go through life like Joseph did and come out on the other side victorious? One word, faith. Faith in God. Faith that God has you in his hand no matter what tragedy comes. And you say, well, did Joseph have faith? Oh, my goodness. As we read the story, he trusted God because there was nobody else. There's nobody else. God. I remember being on those ships, and I had my, I had my Schofield reference study Bible with me. Big one. It fit in my bag. I wore that thing out. It was me and God. Me and God fixing airplanes every day. That's what I did. Working on flight deck. Listen, that's Joseph. I can relate to that. His faith. God, my brothers want to kill me. And God whispering in his ear, just trust me, it's okay. God, I, I got sold into slavery now and I'm going to Egypt. I don't even know what's going to happen. God whispering in his ear, just trust me. It's okay. God speaking to his heart, just trust me. It's okay. I've had those events in my life personally and I'm not going to take the time to tell the stories. Sherry and I both have where we get on our knees before God and he just whispers in your heart, trust me, it's okay, trust me. Joseph was in that kind of situation. It's probably the hardest thing for us when we think about Joseph's situation and our situations in life is the limited view of the future that we have. It goes along with that unknown thing. You know, we look ahead and we can only see so far and it bothers us. And God, again, whispers in our heart and says, hey, I see the whole picture, relax. I got you. It's okay. This part here looks pretty rough, but you don't know what's coming on the other side, and it's okay. And listen, even if all of life, think about it for a minute, if all of life was the pits, I mean, if God allowed us to live in the worst possible circumstances of life continually our entire life here, what is that in comparison to eternity? I mean, what is that in comparison to living 50, 60, 70, 80, sometimes 90 years here compared to forever in glory with God. It doesn't compare. So again, God could whisper in our heart, no matter what tragic thing has come our way, God could whisper in our heart, I, I got you. It's okay. I'm going to take care of you. So that's the first thing I thought about Joseph as he went into this whole situation of going to Egypt. And then when he gets to Egypt, they sell him to a guy named Potiphar. Now, Potiphar is the captain of the guard. He's the, he's the head of Pharaoh's protection service, the secret service. But also, if you read history, he's not only the protection of Pharaoh's secret service, he's the chief executioner, meaning, meaning if Pharaoh says, off with your head, you're gonna, this guy's going to show up with some of his guys and remove your head. So he has a pretty important job. I mean, he protects Pharaoh, and he's the head executioner. And that's who Joseph gets sold to. Now think about that for just a minute. What are the chances 
and I'm using chances in, in a facetious way here, what are the chances that Joseph's brothers decide to sell him into slavery, he gets sold into slavery, he travels all the way to Egypt and gets sold to that guy? No chance, that's what I'm telling you. It's not a chance. Think of all the things that could have happened. On the way there, he could have been sold at any point, any water station, any place, because what did the Ishmaelites want? More than 20 shekels of silver, right? Because they paid 20 for him. You give me 30, he's yours. They just want to make money. They don't care where he gets sold at. But he wasn't sold anywhere on the way there. He's all the way to Egypt, and when he gets there, this is the guy who buys him. What I'm telling you is nothing is an accident in our lives. God had this whole thing coordinated. God had it all coordinated so that when he got there, Potiphar was waiting on him. God had it all under control. I'm going to tell you another quick story. And so many came to my mind in my own life when I was studying this about Joseph. Again, early in my Navy career, I was stationed in Japan for six months, one of my deployments. I had to go live there and work on airplanes. I loved working on airplanes, by the way. I have a private pilot's license. I used to own an airplane, a Cessna 172. You've not lived until you fly airplanes around. That is just, that's the hoop. But I was working in Japan on these airplanes, and it was time for me to get orders. And back then, young people, they're all up there. In 1982, 83, there's no computers. Not like today. There's no internet. There's no cell phones. You know, there's carrier pigeons. You know, hey, fly, you know, I need, you know, I mean, there's, not, there's none of that stuff, right? I mean, there's landline, phone lines, and when you're overseas, you have to get an overseas operator to get you connected to a line back to the United States. It was painful to call back here. Well, to get orders, you had to call your detailer and, and plead with him to not send you to Adak, Alaska or something. You, know, you had to call him and plead with him to send you somewhere where you want to go. And so the orders came out twice a month. Uh, two times a month, the new requisitions would come out of what opened up for jobs. Well, I had been praying, God, Sherry's here, I really want to go back to Jacksonville. We were involved in a church, Sherry's a pianist. Uh, God, here's my list of reasons why you need to leave me in Jacksonville. And so I gave them to God. I don't know what God's going to do, but I give them to him, and I say, Lord, we really would like to stay in Jacksonville. So I called a detailer. We had to use this phone line called a DSN. Anybody heard of that before? Right, you use the DSN, it's a military one. So you call them, and uh, everybody in the Navy who's up for orders that's in your rates calling at the same time. So busy, busy, busy signal. If you get it to ring, you threaten anybody who comes near you with the phone, right, because you got it to ring. So we call this guy on a day to Rex come out, and it rings, and I get him. And I'm talking to him, and I say, hey, man. And he goes, hey, I got a set of orders in Jacksonville, and the line goes dead. I panicked. So I called him back, can't get through, busy, busy, busy. So I can't get a hold of the guy for two or three days. I'm, I'm depressed and dejected. God, I had him on the phone. What happened? You know, and I'm, I'm really thinking I'm going to Adak, Alaska. I'm going, I mean, I'm, whatever's left over that everybody else didn't want, I'm getting when I call this guy back. Watch how God works. God, listen, it was no accident that Joseph, that Potiphar was there waiting on him. Let me tell you how God works. I get a hold of the, the detailer three days later. I'm already depressed when I start talking to him. I'm like, well, I talked to you three days ago. You remember me? He goes, no. <laughs> I said, well, the phone cut off. He goes, sorry. <laughs> I said, what do you have? Is there anything in Jacksonville? And he goes, you're one lucky fella. That's the first words came out of his life. Well, immediately I'm thinking, no, I'm not lucky, God, but what do you got? He said, there were some orders, some wrecks that were late coming out, and I just got them today. He said, and there's orders in Jacksonville, Cecil Field, do you want them? And I said, yes, if the phone cuts off, just cut them and send them to me. <laughs> what I'm telling you is I, I could give you story after story about the sovereignty of God and how he works through adversity, how he works through things that are difficult. You know, I thought three days later, there's going to be the, the crumbs are going to be left, you know, and there's going to be nothing worth having. And yet in God's sovereignty, these extra orders come available three days later. He just got them on his desk. He said, which one do you want? 
So it's like God to lay out a smorgasbord for you, right? When you think you're going to get crumbs, he lays them out for you and says, just pick whatever you want. And I can tell you, God did that over and over and over in my life. So I, I, have this, I have this connection to Joseph when I read this, that he has no idea what's going on, but God is moving in his life and putting him right where he needs to be, okay? Now, look at verses 2 to 6, and we're going to spend the rest of our time in these verses about when he gets there. The Lord was with Joseph. Well, that's a great statement. Joseph didn't know how much God was with him because his life's coming apart. The wheels came off. But God's with him. And he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house and all that he put in under his authority. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house uh, and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. Now what's, look at this. And he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Wow. That's pretty good, isn't it? Let me give you three things to think about in these verses. Number one, God is able to bless us in the midst of the trial. God's able to bless us in the midst of the tribulation. Here's Joseph in the worst time of his life. His brothers meant evil for him. His brothers meant to hurt him. His brothers meant to kill him. And yet in the midst of all this evil, God has blessed Joseph in the midst of his circumstances. Not only did he bless him, but he prospered him. He prospered him. He came to a point where Potiphar had so trusted Joseph with all that he had, he didn't even know what he had except the food that was set on the table. He just came to eat, and Joseph managed everything, even as a slave, even as one who was entrapped in Egypt. And I was thinking about, in life, how God blesses us even in the midst of our difficulties. I've had testimonies from Christians who have gotten sick. Nobody here likes to be sick. I don't like to be sick. I don't like to be sick because Sherry has to take care of me, and she's a good nurse, and I'm a bad patient. You know, I need a cool towel on my head. Can you get me one? You know, that whole thing, right? Nobody likes to be sick, but I've had Christians tell me, hey, I got sick and I had to go to the hospital, and I was praying, you know, God, why am I sick and why am I in the hospital? And then they tell me a story about leading the person in the room with them to Jesus. Maybe your big toe hurt because God wanted you to tell that person about Jesus. I don't know, okay? But what I'm saying is here's Joseph in the worst catastrophe possible in his life for a 17-year-old, and God is using him to be a blessing to other people. So God moved him there, which brings up my second point in this passage. Sometimes God puts us in difficult situations so we can bless other people. Now, that almost seems weird, doesn't it? God, I'm in this situation that I don't want to be in. And God said, I know, but I want you there because you got to bless the other people that are around you, even though you're in a bad situation. And that's exactly what happened to Joseph here. You ever hear, we sing the songs, my cup runs over, right? Fill my cup, Lord, the blessings of my cup runs over. Where do all them blessings go when they run over? It goes to other people. The people standing around you and the people in your life and the people that you work with and the people that you run into, when God's blessing your life and it's full and it's running over, what are we supposed to do with all that? Give it to some other people. Share it with some other people. Let them be blessed because of the connection with us. And understand this, it ain't us, it's God. Amen. And it's his power in our lives. Joseph goes to Potiphar's house and is a blessing to this man. This, this Egyptian who's a lost man, who's a pagan, who's an executioner, who's, a, who's a, probably a, you know, Green Beret, bad dude, tough guy. Joseph's blessing the britches off of him. Joseph goes there, and even it says here that Potiphar noticed the blessing in his life. Now, Potiphar doesn't know Jehovah God, and I don't know if he ever got saved, but he did recognize this, the God you worship, man, he's pretty good. The God you worship, he's blessing you, and because of you, I'm blessed. And then it says Potiphar uh, 
he was in favor with Potiphar. Well, I guess so. Potiphar said, man, my, my portfolio's doubled since you've been here. I like you. The crops are growing since you've been here. I like you. My cattle, I got to build new pens and new barns since you've been here. I like you. So Joseph blessed this man in his life. Are we supposed to do that today? I would suggest we are. I would suggest that Christians in the workforce, let's just use that illustration. Now, some, of, some are retired, and that's fine. But I would suggest wherever we work or labor as Christians, we should be the hardest workers there. We should be the most faithful. We should be on time. We shouldn't be late. We shouldn't let things slide. And if we see things that need to be done, we ought to be proactive. What I'm saying is as Christians, we ought to be a blessing to those around us where we work and where we labor. We ought to be a blessing to those around us in that we're trustworthy and that we're cooperative and that we have a positive attitude. Man, I have, I've had men and women work for me in the military. Negative Nellies, man. I mean, you know, I mean, everything's bad. Everything, no, we can't do that. You know, you say one thing, no, we can't do that. No, that won't work. What do you mean it won't work? Well, I just ain't going to work. Did you think about it? Did you even consider it? No, it just won't work. You know, you ever had somebody like that? Don't be like that, okay? Don't be like that. I mean, but we should be the positive one. We should be the supportive one. We should, we should be the encourager. I think Joseph was an encouragement for Potiphar. And we're going to get into this, this next week, but I think Potiphar's wife, about drove him crazy. We'll talk about it next week. And I think he was a blessing to Potiphar. I can tell you some history, and we might get into it next week, about Egyptian women that fits why Potiphar's wife was the way she was. So you won't come back for that because you'll learn some stuff about Egyptians. But the point is, Joseph was a blessing. And thirdly, thirdly, sometimes God puts us in situations like Joseph found himself in to teach us and prepare us to teach us and prepare us. This is true in my life. I don't know if it is in yours. But when I was in school, and I was in school a lot, if the class was easy, if the material was easy, it was easy. I didn't put a lot of effort into it. I just kind of did it, made my A, and went on my way, right? But the stuff that was difficult, the stuff I had to work at, the stuff I had to spend time in, is the stuff I learned the most. So think about it in life. If life is just happy, tiptoeing through the tulips, man, we're all's good, you know, no problems. Not really paying attention much spiritually, are we? But whoa, when it gets tough and, and the sledding gets hard and, and you got to think about it, you got to pray and you got to spend time, Lord, that's when you learn a lot, isn't it? That's when you learn how to trust Jesus. That's when you learn how to trust God to take care of the things. And that's when you have to trust God. And that's when we learn the most. That's what happened to Joseph. He's in training. He's learning because we already know what's Joseph going to end up being, prime minister of all Egypt. And have you noticed so far in the life of his story, he's a good administrator. Have you noticed that? I mean, he's managing this man's whole house. And when he gets arrested next week, well, he got arrested a long time ago, but for us, when he gets arrested next week, He's going to go into prison. And what's he going to do in the prison? Same thing he's doing in Potiphar's house. He's going to end up running the whole thing, right? The, the jailer's going to go, I can trust you, so you run this thing, and I'll sit up in my little booth and drink my coffee. You run this thing, right? And by the time he becomes prime minister of Egypt, what do we know about him? He's a good administrator. Where'd he learn all that? In the school of hard knocks. Got sold into slavery by his brothers. He ended up a slave uh, at Potiphar in his house, gets thrown in jail. Now think about it from Joseph's perspective. Is that the path you would choose to learn what you need to learn? Not me. Not me. Lord, I'll study really hard. Just don't make me do it that way. Okay? I'll, I'll, I'll do my best, but, you know, the slavery thing and the jail thing, mm, I can do without that. No, God had him in training. God had him there. You may be in training in the difficulties of life. I don't know. I'm not God. I'm just saying God uses the difficulties in our life to train us. One last illustration from my life, and then we'll wrap it up. When I was a teenager, some, I think they were, I'm not sure where they were from. They were from a Christian college, a seminary. And I was in a small country church, 
And they came to our church to sing and to recruit young people to go to our college. I, I, now I know what they were doing. I didn't know what they were doing at the time. And one of the, one of the college young men talked to me about being in seminary and being a preacher. And I said, eh, I'm about as redneck as they come, man. I got a big Chevy truck, and I like to fish. So, I, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not, not doing that. And then I uh, ended up joining the Navy. And then in hindsight, God calls me into the ministry, and, well, here I am. And then I have often thought, I thought, Lord, if I had listened in the first time, you know, I could have went to seminary. And, and, but let me tell you something. Now, being the, the age I am now, I wasn't ready to be in the ministry when I was 19. But I told the guy I was right. I said, no, nah, that, that's not me right now. You know what God did? It took him 20 years to get me trained up. It took him 20 years to get, my, to get my attention. And he did it, and I could tell you some things that God did in my life that got my attention. Really got my attention. And, a lot, and some of it has to do with my children. By the way, your children will get your attention. Okay, God, when, you know, I mean, he will. And when God got my attention, not only did he call me into ministry, but he called me to start a brand new church. Let's not just make this hard, let's make it near impossible, okay? <laughs> what do you need to be able to do to start a brand new church? Administrate, manage, figure stuff out. I'm a retired Navy officer. You know what I did for 20 years? Figure stuff out. Administrate, fix airplanes, maintenance logs, you know, the whole deal. So you see what God was doing? In hindsight, it looks 2020. Sometimes when I was in it, I thought, man, this is hard. I don't, I don't like this. Joseph could say the same thing, but God was teaching him and preparing him. I would say, let's be careful. Let me finish with two or three things to think about. Well, sometimes when we are in God's way, and we don't know why things happen that they happen. We can become discontent. And that's hard. It's hard, it's hard, it's hard because we're humans. But we can become discontent. Let me just put it in a job, in a job or ministry. Sometimes we might think, Lord, why am I here doing this thing? Why, why aren't I over there doing that thing? And God, why haven't you moved me from here to there? Or God, why hasn't this become like what I think it ought to be? That's human, and we do that. And it's easy to happen in the ministry, by the way. Lord, why does that church have 800 and we have 400? I mean, that's human. You start doing that, which is sinful, by the way. We shouldn't do that. But it's easy for us to do that. And we need to pray not to do that. We have to pray to be patient and content where we are. I can assure you when Joseph was in jail, that wasn't where he wanted to be. In fact, when he interprets the dreams for, for the two men, he's pretty anxious. Hey, tell, hey, would you tell somebody what I did for you so I can get out of here? He don't want to be there, and that's okay. But we have to learn to be patient where we are. The second thing we have to learn is not only to be patient, but to be content to do the thing God's called us to do and not always be looking for something else to do. If God calls us in our whole life, listen to this now. This is, we're going to close. Let's say God gave you the spiritual gift to work with children. And you spend your entire life in some kind of ministry with children in the church. And you think, Lord, surely there's something greater I can do. Surely there's something better I can do. No, listen to me. If that's the thing God enabled and called you to do, that is the greatest thing you can be doing. Because God will multiply it. You don't know that one of them kids you lead to Jesus becomes the next Billy Graham. You don't know. You don't know that that spot. Let me give you a biblical illustration. We're going to close. In Acts chapter 8, persecution broke out in Jerusalem and the Christians scattered, okay? And uh, one of the places they went was to Samaria. We don't like them Samaritans, but persecution in Jerusalem and they need to hear the gospel, so we're going. One of the guys who went to Samaria was named Philip. 
And the Bible says Philip went there preaching the gospel. And revival broke out. And people are getting saved by the skies. In fact, so many people are getting saved, they sent word back to Jerusalem and sent Peter and John down there. Hey, there's a revival. We need to send the heavy hitters. Go, go get the guys. Go get Peter and John. Send them down there. You know what's impressive about Philip? He started it. God, you, he went down there and started preaching, and the place broke out. And there's people getting saved everywhere. He's not mad when Peter and John show up. He don't care. They show up and, you know, they're, they're the most well-known guys from the church in Jerusalem. He don't care. And then you know how I really know he didn't care, that it ain't about him, that he's going to do? Then the Spirit comes to him in the midst of this big revival in Samaria and says, hey, I want you to leave here and go out in the middle of the desert. Think about that. Now, it would have been easy from a human perspective to say, now, wait a minute, Lord. I came over here and started preaching and look at this. They need me here. No, he didn't do that. He didn't go, Lord, why do I have to go in the desert? There's so many people here who need to be saved. Why can't I stay here? Which would be very human response for many of us. No, you don't get any of that. You know what Philip did? He grabbed his ditty bag and he headed out into the desert. Now watch this. Here's, here's the point. Who's he meet out there in the desert? Remember Ethiopian eunuch, right? Now you know about this Ethiopian eunuch. He's been down to Jerusalem bought himself a scroll, which was no small task, by the way. Got himself a scroll of Isaiah, and he's reading it on the way home in his chariot. And here comes Philip out there in the middle of the desert and runs up alongside this guy's chariot, hears him reading from Isaiah and says, do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian eunuch said, how can I unless somebody tell me? And he said, move over. He climbed up in the chariot with him and explained and took him right to Jesus and said, here's how you get saved. Ethiopian eunuch said, well, there's some water. What hinders me from being baptized? He said, nothing. If you've been saved, they get out, get down in the water, get baptized, get back in the chariot. He goes back to Ethiopia. They say, what's the big deal? That was one guy. Mm -hmm. Read church history. The church broke out in that part of Africa. You know how? Probably because some fellows like the Ethiopian eunuch met one guy, got saved, and took the gospel back to that part of the world and multitudes got saved. So Philip could have complained and said, Lord, boy, look at this revival here in Samaria. I need to stay here. And God said, no, you need to go out in the desert where I told you to go and meet this guy that I got coming by to see you because you ain't seen the people going to get saved if you lead that guy to salvation. What I'm saying is our lives are the same way. We can't see all that God's doing. I know I can't. And there's been times in my life I've prayed and said, Lord, I'm as blind as a bat in this thing. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know how this is going to work out. I have no idea. But here's what I always tell them, but I trust you. God's never let me down, ever. Not one time. Not one time. So be encouraged tonight. Whenever you think you've got a Joseph scenario going on, trust God, okay? Just trust him. Turned out real well for Joseph, and it'll turn out real well for us too if we just trust him, okay? I pray tonight, if you're watching online or you watch this video later, that you are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. I pray that you have confessed your sin to God and asked him to save you. Uh, Jesus loves you. Died on the cross, paid for your sin. If you're here tonight and you've never been saved, would you come? Would you invite Jesus to save you right now? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and the encouragement that it brings. Lord, life is hard. And God, we do run into those times in life when it's a tragedy. God, it's a, it's a thing that we didn't expect. And God, it's hard, but you are faithful. God, you are faithful. Thank you for being a great God. Thank you, Lord, that you see the beginning to the end and all the points in between. God, you know all things. And God, it is encouraging that you have our best at heart. Lord, you love us. Bless those, God, who are hurting. Bless those who have those experiences in life and those may be going through them now. Lord, bless the Ferreira family and the loss of their daughter yesterday. God, bless them in this time of tragedy in their life. Help us as a church to be a blessing to them. God, if there's somebody here tonight who needs Jesus, right now in this moment, Lord, may they just pray from their seat and say, God, I'm sorry for my sin. God, I put my faith in Jesus, your son. Forgive me and save me right now. God, we ask these things in your holy name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing. If you need to come on the first verse. I'll be glad to pray and help you.
Thanks for being here tonight. Let me encourage you, if you're not in a small Bible study group on Wednesday night, we're starting 1 Thessalonians this week, I think. Uh, first 10 verses. So it be a great study in the New Testament. We got classes for you. We got, we, listen, you enjoy coming, fellowship, and let me encourage you to do that, okay? Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for what we've learned, for your word, for God encouraging us. Bless this week now. Uh, help us, God, to honor you wherever we find ourselves in life. In Jesus' name, amen.